I see the green light. Push this all the way up until it turns green. That means it's active. Yeah, you can hear it. Yep. Now it's on.
Kristen. I have a good I have a good one. 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 I have um, so it is 5.35, uh, and we'll call this uh, joint study session to order uh, of the plan of the Talent City Council and the Planning Commission. Roll call, please. Uh, Commissioner Buglo is absent. Commissioner Davis. Commissioner Riley is absent. Uh, Commissioner Riley. Hello, Commissioner Riley is here. Commissioner Shapiro. Commissioner Hazel. Commissioner Hazel, not here. Commissioner Diamato and Chair Volkart. Councilor Brian Miller. Here. Councilor Byers. Here. Councilor Pestizo is not present. Councilor Greider. Councilor Panemarov, Councilor Clark, Here. and Mayor Ayers Flood. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you, Hector. For the record, uh, everybody is here um, except for Councilor Bastizo and Councilor, uh, no, Commissioner Hazel, um, just because not everybody had a microphone. And uh, uh, Commissioner Bucolo. Um, after, uh, I'm going to make a quick introduction, after which I'm going to ask uh, Hector to, to talk about sound tonight. Um, we have a more formal welcoming on the city council um, agenda tonight to welcome our new city manager, Gary Milliman. But for those who are joining us um, on Zoom um, and for this study session, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Gary Milliman, who is our new city manager, started uh, on the second. The second. Uh, and uh, please join us in welcoming uh, him for his first meeting. Yep. All right, so um, with that, uh, we will hand it over to who's doing the staff report. Kristen? Uh, Kristen Mays, City of Talent. Good evening, Council and Commissioners. Um, I won't be doing a staff report, but I will be introducing um, the uh, David Sacamano, who is the, part of the consulting team, project manager from OTEC. We have, I think, Christopher Green from OTEC. We have Elizabeth Decker from Jet Planning. 
and we have Laura Buell from DLCD. And um, so all these people have been part of this project. It's been ongoing for over a, about a year, over maybe a little over a year. Um, as you all know, this is the Highway 99 Bear Creek Greenway Corridor revisioning project. And they're here tonight to talk to you about what's happened so far and how we're gonna move forward with this project. So I will turn it over to David and um, I don't, and then he will um, share his screen for the presentation. And you all have the memorandum that um, he has uh, written for you tonight that goes over this and also the uh, printout of the PowerPoint. Great, and David, before you get before you get started, uh, I did uh, want to hand the mic to Hector, who wanted to talk a little bit about uh, sound. We are um, we're working off microphones tonight. He just wanted to give a few instructions. So, Hector, sorry about skipping over you. No disrespect. Oh, pardon me, counselors and commissioners. Uh, we don't have enough body packs uh, for everyone in on the on the dais, and the body packs are these um, devices that I'm holding. So what we're hoping to do is to have everyone share the handheld mics. If someone could hold up a handheld, um, so we'll just pass these around uh, to whoever needs to uh, to speak. Just make sure that the light on the side is green and that indicates that the mic is active. Thank you. Thank you, Hector. All right, uh, so we're handing it off to you, David. Great. Um, good evening, everyone, or afternoon, I guess. It's still afternoon. Um, I just wanna do a quick sound check can folks hear me? Maybe a little thumbs up if it's sounding okay. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Kristen, for the, the introduction. My name is David Sakamano. I'm a, um, a planner and a project manager with OTAC, and I'll be um, facilitating the conversation tonight, and um, we'll kind of run through our agenda that we're going to go through and then be handing this off to a few folks to help um, kind of answer some uh, other parts of the presentation. Um, so um, as Kristen mentioned, I'm joined here tonight um, by Laura Buell, who's the project director uh, with Oregon Department of Land and Conservation. And uh, who Laura is a land use and transportation planner and has been involved with this project um, since day one and um, will be a resource here if there are any um, more programmatic questions that come up. Um, also joining me is Elizabeth Decker uh, with Jet Planning. And Elizabeth's been focused on the um, recommendations that are uh, gonna be in our presentation tonight about the comprehensive plan and the development code. And those really stem from a lot of the work that um, I'll go over here, but we do want to make sure that we have some time to go over those recommendations. Um, I also am joined here with uh, Chris Green, who's uh, been participating as a planner um, on the OTAC team. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, just to briefly, I'll go ahead and share my screen here, and then let me know if um, you guys have any questions as I start to go through this. Uh, but I think this should work pretty well. David, while you're doing that, let the record yeah. show that Commissioner Hazel is uh, present. Excellent. Okay. Got my screen up. Can everyone see that okay? Great. Okay. So um, just went through our introductions here. So we'll start this off by doing just a brief project overview about the project. Um, and then I'm going to spend a few minutes talking through the public process because I think that's very integral to, to the recommendations that are coming out of this. Um, we've been working on this project um, oh, close to 16 months now, so um, there's been a lot of work and a lot of input and contributions by the community, um, city staff, county staff, and so I want to make sure I um, have an opportunity to talk a little bit about that. Um, then I'm going to switch over and talk about the placemaking recommendations. And um, part of what we did um, with this project is to, to work with the community members to develop um, a series of recommendations um, to help meet project goals. And, and those are related to placemaking and urban design and, and public spaces and types of development that we want to see within the corridor. Um, after that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Elizabeth to talk about the comp plan and development code recommendations. 
and then we'll uh, wrap it up with some next steps. So in regards to a project overview, um, again, this project is um, funded um, through the Oregon um, TGM program. So this is the Oregon Transportation and Growth Management Program, uh, which is a partnership program between um, Oregon Department of Transportation and the Department of Land and Conservation and Development. Um, really, these funds were geared towards um, funding planning work um, that helps um, focus on smart growth. So uh, multiple mobilities, um, different types of development, um, and really focuses on both uh, land use and transportation. The project area is, um, is quite long. It's a, a corridor that extends from um, really from unincorporated areas on the north uh, end of this map here of Jackson County all the way down uh, through Phoenix and Talent and down to um, City of Ashland. Um, the purple line you see here is the project study area. Um, so that was the area that uh, we focused on for our, our existing conditions analysis and our, our planning work and envisioning. Uh, the gray line shown here are the city limits. And so you can kind of see the overlap between the two there. Um, and really um, a big portion of this uh, project area focused on areas that were affected by the burn. So uh, really revisioning those areas um, and thinking about how those areas could uh, be to re redeveloped moving forward. Project um, objectives, um, and you'll see that this is phase one. Um, I'll talk a little bit here at the end about what phase two will be of this project. But really the objectives for this um, were to, to create a cohesive vision for the corridor, um, to try to think about how um, the, the land use and development along this corridor could be um, you know, unified throughout the different jurisdictions. Um, really looking for opportunities to enhance multimodal transportation. So that would be um, pedestrian facilities and, and bike facilities and looking um, for opportunities to safely engage with Highway 99. Um, and then really about promoting um, connectivity to the Greenway and the trail and understanding that that's a really significant resource for the communities. Um, objectives to promote mixed use development and really to kind of diversify um, the economic viability of the area. So um, acknowledging um, the existing land use and successes that are there, but also really looking at how this project could help um, catalyze and, and look for other opportunities for mixed use development. Um, housing was a big piece um, throughout this, really how do we um, replace housing that was lost and then also how do we, how can this project help um, encourage affordable housing within the area? And then um, exploring placemaking strategies. So again, um, what can the communities do um, to make this area unique? How do we build upon uh, the amenities that are already there um, to really make this uh, corridor shine? Um, so phase one, um, as I mentioned, we've been working on this since about August of 22. And so a lot of work has been done. Um, work here has really been bulleted out. You can see um, that we've had a series of, of outreach meetings, uh, worked with community groups, uh, did a pretty extensive existing conditions analysis, looked at um, uh, kind of economics of the area, development feasibility, what would work out here, um, placemaking, which I'll go over here in a little bit, and then um, analyzing the code for both um, City of Phoenix and City of Talent in, in Jackson County and looking at opportunities to implement some of that vision. Um, so really what we are right now is, um, in, you know, in the middle of jurisdiction meetings. So um, you're the first one here for our, our project to engage with. Uh, we will be meeting with both uh, City of Phoenix and also uh, Jackson County here later in the month. Um, as I mentioned, uh, community engagement is a pretty significant piece uh, of this project, and I, I want to start off by thanking uh, members of uh, talent, um, city staff, and also Phoenix and Jackson County. Um, everyone's put in quite a bit of time. Um, we established a project management team um, right at the very beginning who 
uh, essentially meant monthly and sometimes more frequently um, and really helped drive the, the project and provided the leadership and vision for this. Uh, we had a couple committees that were established. Um, the first one is a project advisory committee. Um, there was over 25 members in that. Um, and this community or committee met a minimum of three times over the over a course of a year, um, really to help review content of, and the deliverables and also to provide some needed perspective and, and technical advice um, and policy input. Um, so the uh, PAC was really a pretty integral for, for what we did here. Um, we also had a citizen advisory committee. Um, the CAC really focused on uh, members who live or work within um, the study area or folks that were displaced by the fire. Um, so this group, um, we met twice as a, as a group to really um, kind of brainstorm and review documents, but we also had a, a specific placemaking workshop um, that was just for the CAC members. Um, and that was really, uh, really fruitful. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the outcomes of that. I'm um, really, you know, throughout the project, the CAC was there to, to provide that input and to, to give us some feedback. Um, in addition to those uh, groups, we, we did um, really start the project off with a series of stakeholder interviews. Um, so really focused on opportunities and, and existing uh, challenges, I'll say, for the corridor. Um, so that was a, a really relevant input. Uh, we did an online survey, again, talking about existing um, opportunities um, and existing conditions. Um, that was done in both English and Spanish language. Uh, we held two workshops. Um, I mentioned the CAC workshop that was May of this year. Um, and then we did a, a community-wide workshop uh, that was um, also held in early May. Um, and that was held at the Phoenix High School. Um, other outreach that was part of this project is we um, developed um, a branding, kind of a branding campaign for this and a project logo really to try to help make this project identifiable um, to members of the community as they were going to be seeing uh, information um, coming out about this project. Uh, we created a project website, um, and so hopefully you will have a chance to go take a look at that. Um, I, it is, there's a link to that in the memo that we distributed. Um, so you can, in that website, find um, a lot of the uh, project documentation, including um, final versions of the reports and memos, um, as well as some uh, other project information. Um, of course, we use uh, tools like social media, um, and email and text blasts uh, to, to get the word out about public uh, involvement opportunities, as well as uh, to advertise the surveys. Um, and then uh, we partnered with the city and county um, to take advantage of tools that they already had in place um, for public engagement. So with that, um, I'm going to talk briefly about placemaking. Um, and the reason I think this is relevant and we will dedicate a little bit of time tonight is that a lot of the recommendations that are going to come out of the, um, out of this project um, for either comp plan or code recommendations, development code or update recommendations, um, were things that were identified in the placemaking. So I'll kind of run through a couple of the highlights of that. Um, so um, image here, you can see um, of one of our CAC meetings, this was the, the workshop that we did for the CAC group. Um, we did a lot of uh, kind of visioning and brainstorming, um, identifying priorities, but we also did some interesting things like a visual preference survey. So we showed different uh, public amenities, different development types and had folks um, essentially vote on those and, and provide feedback. Um, that's all really well uh, developed and documented in the, the placemaking uh, report, which you can find on the website. A um, couple summary points that came out of that. Um, for City of Talent, uh, there was a lot of ideas of, of creating um, gateways and sense of entry uh, to the city, particularly with Valley View Road and Highway 99. Um, I think everyone acknowledged the kind of importance of that location and what kind of a gateway element or even some type of transportation element that could uh, serve as a gateway. 
one of the ideas that came up was a roundabout or some kind of um, change in the, the vehicle circulation through there. Um, the um, existing ir talent irrigation district property um, came up several times in both the CAC workshop and at the public workshop um, about how, how that site um, is integral to, to what happens in uh, the downtown district of talent and um, opportunities for, for future uses there um, should uh, the TID um, decide to uh, do something different with their property. Um, it's really centrally located and is really kind of um, at the hub of, of what could happen down there. Um, other considerations were um, the idea of more mixed use development. And there's some really great examples that are already happening right now, but um, you know, whether it's um, kind of horizontal mixed uses, you know, different uses being side by side, or the idea of, of some vertical mixed use, um, you know, obviously in character with the community, but, um, you know, that idea of some, maybe some residential mixed with commercial or, or other types of uses. And so those things came up um, along with the idea of creating public spaces. And, oh, people really love the, the Greenway, Bear Creek Greenway and the trail. And there was a lot of, um, you know, importance placed on that and people wanting to kind of extend that public amenity from just the greenway into little fingers of that back into the cities um, and the communities and neighborhoods. So um, you know, ideas of creating more public spaces um, along, along Highway 99 in particular. A um, couple other comments and themes that came out, um, you know, the idea of um, kind of maximizing utilization of the land. So, you know, commercial areas, um, could, could those be repurposed or could they um, have other uh, potential uses to, you know, focus on other community needs such as housing? Um, ideas of connecting uh, the neighborhoods um, to, to Highway 99 and the um, Bear Creek Greenway and looking for those opportunities like um, the Wagner Creek Greenway Trail um, and other open spaces that could be used to help link the neighborhoods um, to Bear Creek. Um, and then the idea of, um, and this was kind of a central theme in, in, in both meetings, but you know, the idea of really embracing um, local businesses, um, folks, uh, kind of maker spaces, people, local artisans, um, and making sure that we're providing spaces for them and, and um, you know, some critical mass so that those kinds of businesses um, can really flourish within the community. Um, lastly, I'll just wrap up here on transportation opportunities. Um, so we did um, in a, you know, an assessment of um, transportation linkages along the corridor, you know, really focusing on Highway 99, but also looking at um, you know, areas where there are potential needs for additional crossings or um, other types of, um, you know, bicycle facilities or pedestrian facilities. Um, so again, a, a really common theme, and I mentioned this already, but is this, you know, linkage to uh, the Bear Creek Greenway, uh, making sure that the um, is, you know, accessible and it's safe for people to, um, getting across Highway 99 um, and so that they can access that amenity. Um, a lot of uh, comments about bike lanes and, and making sure that um, there's good accessibility and connectivities for, for bike uh, mobility. Um, and then also um, along uh, Highway 99 and Valley View, the idea of uh, you know, providing those kinds of signage or uh, features, um, you know, buffered bike areas, things like that, that can help with um, safety and make that experience of riding through the corridor um, uh, better for, for users. So um, again, these things all came out of conversations with the CAC and also with the community-wide placemaking uh, workshops. And, and I think they're pretty relevant. And, and as you can see, there's a lot of there that um, you know, really wants to embrace what already is happening within City of Talent, um, but also kind of looking forward and looking at those recommendations for um, how some of these uh, placemaking opportunities can be uh, implemented. So with that, I will go ahead and turn this over to Elizabeth, who can run through um, some of the outcomes from the placemaking and what that may look like on our comp plan and development code. Thank you, Elizabeth. 
Um, and I'll still continue to drive the presentation here and, and Elizabeth will just let me know when it's time to go to the next slide. Yeah, thanks, David. And thanks, Mayor, um, members of the Council and Planning Commission, as well as city staff. It's a delight to be back in front of you discussing um, the community and ways to strengthen it. Um, I always enjoy working in talent. So thanks for having me. Um, as David mentioned, I've been working with a project team over the past year um, to help analyze the existing comprehensive plan and the zoning code um, in terms of how they relate to some of the existing opportunities and the emerging opportunities um, through the placemaking, as well as um, David didn't mention, but we also had, um, did we call it a market feasibility study? Um, that, but just that also helped us inform sort of what development opportunities um, are ripe here and what could become, you know, a greater potential moving forward. Um, so of course, you know, for to ground you, we wanted to include the the current zoning, and I think what I'd point out is, you know, again, this is um, this is the northern half of Talent, and it's fairly narrow strip um, focused along those two corridors of Highway 99 and the Greenway. Um, what's notable, right, is that it just nibbles at the edge of the downtown district, um, but is largely focused on that Highway 99 corridor where we really see a patchwork. There's about five different commercial zones um, that are affected in this project area. And so some of the recommendations deal with how to create more consistency and linkages between them, but just you know the, the different colors on the map illustrate some of the challenges of like, oh, well, if it's this block, these standards apply, but then it's a little different down the way. And when we think about the overall project goal of creating um, a cohesive, which isn't the same as uniform, but a cohesive feel along this corridor um, that does create some challenges and opportunities. Um, most of the residential zoning um, that you'll, as you know, that along this corridor um, is sort of sandwiched between the Greenway and Highway 99. So we'll talk a bit about some of that, but that is is off the highway itself for the most part. Next slide. <clears throat> <clears throat> and then, yeah, again, going through southern half of talent here um, as it heads into the, the county, sort of, um, again, similar mix, a little bit of that patchwork of commercial zones, um, and then heads into the, the rural areas. So next. Um, so, of course, like good planners, we started with uh, the long-term community vision, analyzing the comprehensive plan, uh, ha which has multiple elements, some of which are newer than others. Um, so we looked at, you know, everything from the parks element that parts of which date, date back to 1999, um, to some of the economic land use downtown. And of course the housing element that, um, was done in about 2017. Um, and so the overarching, um, takeaway from that plan is that, um, generally the plan creates, you know, good mix of policy policies that are supportive of the mixed use commercial corridor along Highway 99, um, as well as promoting access and preservation to the Greenway itself um, and transportation policies and projects that support both of those uses. And so for the most part, we didn't see a lot of changes that were needed in the comprehensive plan. Um, two pieces that stood out to us um, to as flags for your future consideration, but not necessarily as a direct implementation of this project um, in phase two would be um, with the next housing needs analysis, of course, you'd be expecting to see some real changes as a result of the post-fire conditions, um, changes to both the inventory as well as population and needs. And so that could be really interesting um, to, to keep an eye on that as you move forward. Um, and that also the natural hazards element um, could have some more additional detail added about responding to wildfire risks. So uh, to keep in mind for, for future comp plan updates. And next piece. But the biggest implementation really comes, uh, the biggest implementation opportunity is to build on those placemaking recommendations as well as realize some of that development potential comes with changes to the, um, to the zoning code, the development code. Um, and when we think about what the opportunities are and, and analyzing the existing code, um, as I mentioned, there's five different commercial zones um, within this project area. 
Uh, they each do have slightly different functions. Um, there's two primarily focused along the highway corridor itself. And then there's like a, an interchange commercial, obviously focused more on Valley View Road. Um, and so that creates, you know, a range of opportunities along Highway 99. Um, there's also this variety of residential zones, mostly the higher density R3 zone. There's also some manufactured home zoning. Um, and we don't have a lot of recommendations that emerged from this plan about those residential zones. The general findings were um, that the City of Talent has done a really good job, um, as many of you have been involved in, of expanding housing opportunities, creating a variety of housing, a lot of middle housing, um, so that those opportunities exist. Um, there were some small opportunities to align some of the open space requirements for the highest density apartment type developments. So um, those details are in the report, but not, not a lot that we need to highlight here. We also had a chance to talk with um, Kristen and others about the manufactured home parks and the rebuilding status. Um, and the analysis was that they that there weren't further code changes that were needed to support that. Um, so all in all, the zoning for residential areas, you know, got mostly a clean bill of health, um, that it, it's doing its job to support the project objectives to provide that variety of housing, um, bringing people to the area and creating these um, active mixed use um, areas. Um, and then next, if you would, please, David, when we talk, uh, when we look at the commercial zones, um, probably the biggest opportunity is to create more coherent site design standards along Highway 99. And this stems both from the fact that there are just these different zones, and so the standards are different in the different zones, um, but also that none of them really address that highway frontage um, and creating this mixed-use, multimodal, walkable area um, very coherently. Um, and so there's really some opportunities to revise the code, um, looking at uh, standards that create a relationship between buildings and the streets. So things like um, revising the minimum as well as the maximum setbacks, creating um, entr entryways that open onto the street that are pedestrian oriented rather than onto parking lots, um, creating more, um, so more of a, a functional approach where, um, let our recommendations again are more site design and less building design. They don't you don't necessarily um, we didn't hear, for example, in the placemaking workshop that it was important to have a uniform palette, say, of materials or or a look. It was more just about enhancing the function of these buildings so that they are are relating to street, relating to each other, bringing people in regardless of what means of travel they use to access the site. Um, so part of that is also minimizing the, the impacts from cars and enhancing pedestrian circulation. Um, a, a key one there is really just talking about where the locations of parking lots are. Right now, none of the zones, um, aside from, let's see, I got this down. Um, yeah, in some of the CBH zone, yeah, the CBH zone limits the parking in the front setback, but most of the other zones you can have a giant parking lot right on Highway 99, which is really going to detract from that community feel and um, that coherent greenway that, or not greenway, apologize, corridor that we're looking to create with this um, for the, throughout the city. That doesn't, you know, we certainly are aware that cars are, are coming to this area. That is one of the important modes of access. Um, and so it's more about minimizing those impacts, but with um, the location of those parking areas, how drive-throughs where they are permitted um, near the interchange are configured, other types of uses like that. Um, and then also another key piece is thinking about larger scale buildings. Um, and I believe that's over 30,000 square feet in the talent code right now. There are some standards about that, but just um, making it a little more coherent how those apply across different zones along this corridor. Um, and there's really some opportunities with this, these site design standards to also think about how those interface with the placemaking standards. Um, so things like street tree plantings, other street furniture, um, street lighting, the sidewalks, having that interface between the public realm and the private realm um, uh, is going to be really important to creating the overall feel that, you know, we as planners and as, as city um, knowledgeable city folks understand that there's an invisible property line, but the average person using the site 
experiences the whole the whole experience together. So um, looking at, at how to bring both those pieces together. A uh, few other main themes that came out of the recommendations, um, we're looking at revisiting some of the ground floor commercial standards. Um, right now, this is sort of a choose your own adventure, um, but we wanted to, to at least start with some minimum recommendations in these commercial zones along the highway corridor. Um, as you recall, we've discussed previously before this project even about what's the right mix of residential in with commercial. Um, especially as you know, the development report highlighted that that demand for retail and office spaces is changing, as I'm sure you've experienced in your own community, um, and that the need for housing is greater than it's ever been. Um, so, looking at ways that more housing can get integrated in right now, the code allows residential in these commercial zones as part of either a vertical or horizontal mixed use development. Um, there's some unclear language about needing a, a commercial storefront um, that, so, you know, sort of a, a step one minimum would be clarifying what that means. What does it mean to have a commercial storefront? How, what percentage of the frontage is it? How much commercial area? Is it a ratio? Is it, um, you know, a, a measurement? Um, so adding some clarity there. And then from there, it could really take off depending on the city's direction about what additional changes to those ground floor commercial standards um, you might be interested to see whether that's relaxing it for some places, whether it's focusing it, you know, on some key locations where it really is important, say at that Valley View and Highway 99 intersection where we heard about um, the placemaking recommendation for some mixed use development, you know, maybe doubling down on the ground floor commercial requirements there, but some other places on the corridor, it's less important. Um, so that's how you could continue to build on those recommendations through the code. Um, one of the, generally the mix of uses um, for the commercial residential office employment uses made sense. Um, but the one that stood out was really that self-storage is permitted in most of these commercial zones along Highway 99. And that can really, you know, just suck a lot of energy out of an active corridor, St recognizing that that's still a need. Um, the direction from, you know, from the different stakeholders was to look at limiting that self-storage along Highway 99 itself, um, so that the frontage of 99 is more active uses and self-storage could be located, um, you know, off to the, on a side street. <clears throat> uh, generally creating greater street connectivity within the project area, that's going to be both transportation related, placemaking type recommendations, but also there's some standards that we can add um, into the code about what the block lengths are and, and where pedestrian connections and new streets are gonna be triggered um, at the time of development. Um, and then finally shifting a little, oh, I'll say just one other piece about the commercial um, is also looking at, you know, with all of these standards, developing them with the greatest degree of specificity and clarity so that more developments can be permitted through a type two staff level review um, rather than more discretionary standards that would necessitate a planning commission just um, public you know, discretionary review with a public hearing um, for commercial development. So the more development that can be re reviewed um, objectively at a staff level can really help enhance uh, the development process and, and um, get the city moving towards the types of development that it identifies with these standards um, meets the community vision. And then the one other piece moving away from the commercial um, is that we saw an opportunity for some further review about the standards um, for the greenway overlay that applies on, on Bear Creek. Um, so not so partially the, the, the greenway overlay for those properties itself, those uses are pretty well contained because they're in public use, but particularly looking at the transition area between um, the public greenway area and private property, if there need to be some additional setbacks, both for riparian health as, and um, sort of aesthetic and visual impacts on the corridor itself, um, things like setting parking areas back or directing lighting away from the greenway so that development on adjacent private property um, is not impacting the greenway in, in ways that adversely affect it. So that was um, a separate piece. And then next, please. 
<laughs> and then um, in the midst of our work on, on the Bear Creek Greenway, we're also getting additional direction that really dovetails pretty well um, from the state about the Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities, or CFEC, um, as that program is rolling out and how those standards and requirements affect the city of talent. Um, and so the, the overall goals for CFEC, and I, I, this is your map of the city's adopted map of, of the climate friendly area, you'll notice it overlaps with a significant portion of the project area um, for the Bear, for Highway 99 and Bear Creek Greenway project. Um, and more than that, the project goals, right, and the aims and objectives overlap pretty well. Um, and so there are some not contradictory, but enhanced recommendations for this area within um, that's been identified as the climate friendly area, where over and above some of those recommendations we are talking about for the commercial zones, some additional um, code recommendations apply. Um, so within the CFA specifically, um, which is this area identified with crosshatching, um, generally around the West Valley View and um, Highway 99, uh, excuse me, intersection um, going up and down the highway there. Um, uh, just dimensionally wise, like a few things that stand out is that building heights need to be, um, allowed building heights need to be increased up to 50 feet. Right now it's 30 feet for all of those zones with a few options to go to 40 feet. Um, and so looking at a 50 foot height limit for those areas, um, also, there's a need to introduce a minimum density of 15 units per acre, um, as well as um, having an unlimited maximum density so that, you know, whatever fits within that 50 feet within the lot coverage standards that the city has, um, that there's no cap there. Um, the city doesn't have a minimum density, but I don't, I don't think the 15 units per acre is really inconsistent with the existing regulations. It's just more specific. Uh, maximum density, there also is not a maximum density right now. So um, it's really the increased height that's going to allow greater densities that are currently permitted. And then there's some additional um, uh, review that's needed that really went beyond the scope of this project. Um, CFEC and these rules didn't exist when we initially scoped this project. And, and so they've been evolving in tandem. And as uh, as the state and the city um, and other partners move into phase two, we recommend some further review of, of the specifics of the CFEC rules that address some allowed uses and some development standards, but they address things that are wholly consistent with the goals of this project, things like greater pedestrian connectivity, um, building entrances that front onto the street, um, moving parking to the side and rear, of sites rather than between the street and buildings. Um, so there's just a, a lot of overlap here, a lot of you know similar um, rowing in the in the same direction. Um, and then the first bullet that I that I skipped over is that um, citywide, um, you know, sort of separately from this project, it will affect the corridor, but also citywide, there are some updates needed. Um, to implement CFEC rules that are specifically about parking and about electric vehicle charging and, and the parking regulations. Um, Kristen, maybe when we get into discussion, if there are questions, you can jump in and, and remind me where the city's at on this. But um, there's a couple pieces about either limiting or even eliminating maximum park or minimum parking requirements, as well um, as introducing maximum parking ratios. Um, and, oh, and part design standards for large parking lots. So things like having more trees and landscaping, um, and good pedestrian connectivity between large parking lots. So those are all pieces that, um, need to be implemented as part of CFEC, but are not specific to this work, um, on the Greenway. And I think that's it for our, our key recommendations, if you would, David. Um, so yeah, we have the opportunity to turn it over and hear from you. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, we've got about 15 minutes left here. So we'll welcome uh, comments or questions that um, council or commission may have for us. Thank you, David. Are there any questions from commissioner council? Uh, commissioner Volkart? Thank you. 
Uh, thanks for um, your presentation there. Uh, Elizabeth, it's good to see you again. Um, I'm off to the side of Councillor Clark. I'll just wave and that's fine. Um, um, we've asked about you several times in the last couple of years. Um, you, you may have not gotten word, but uh, um, you, you, were, you are missed. So oh, we have some you. unfinished business with you. So uh, I hope soon. we get to it soon. Um, so I guess I got a couple questions here. Um, and I appreciate you guys being here tonight. And I'm sorry to be commenting toward the end of phase one. Um, so some of these changes seem like they're more general, not focused on focused on the fire. And uh, I get that because we're talking about the corridor. But I want to give you an example. It's been less than three years since we completed our Title 17 and 18 zone code changes in order to remove barriers for development and to provide clear and objective standards to our code language. What I'm trying to understand is that when you're asking for additional um, additional movement um, of processes from type three to type two, when we just created those for DLCD and we did get that clean bill of health uh, with our title 17 and 18 changes, um, I'm curious why we're moving more so if, if you have a chance to drill down specifically on that, uh, I would be curious um, what the goal is there, um, because I assumed we had passed that um, within the last couple of years. And then, um, and likewise with uh, the redevelopment of underutilized commercial areas for housing purposes, um, in October of 21, we had a joint session. It may have been the last time we were in joint session um, as two groups here where uh, the two bodies decided to hold off on further development of residential buildability in our commercial zones in order to create an incentivized program um, rather than opening it up wide open the way Phoenix did so that we could provide more housing, but also provide more affordable housing. And so I was hoping that's why we've asked, we've looked forward to seeing you because hoping to get back to that. And uh, maybe this process is why we haven't been able to get back to it, but I'm concerned that we're losing sight of that. Um, uh, certainly the community was clear. And when I say the community, I mean, the elected officials and all the appointed officials uh, on the planning commission. And so I just wonder if if that's um, what the status of that process would be as it meshes with this process moving from phase one into phase two. And, um, and then one final question I have is, you'll have to forgive me for being ignorant about it, but I can't recall how the CFA boundary was created how that was determined and if you could just uh if somebody could just inform me on that i would certainly appreciate it and thank you very much yeah thanks commissioner um i can provide a little clarity on those first two questions just to um explain more the overview comments um and then i'll look maybe to kristen to some to talk about how the cfa boundary was created um but when we talk about moving more to clear and objective standards you are very correct. We spent a lot of time um, updating Title 17 and 18 um, with a focus on residential development. And that is the state requirement um, in statute that residential development be permitted through only clear and objective standards and processes. Um, and the recommendation specific to this project, um, generally the housing pieces, as I mentioned, got a, a pretty clean bill of health. Um, but that when we look to the commercial areas, that a lot of commercial development right now still triggers a, a type three site development plan review or site development review. Um, and that there could be some opportunities, particular, and right now there's probably a reason to do those type three re reviews because some of the standards, um, like the setbacks talk about like, you know, provide adequate buffering or provide you know, uh, unless conditions are unforeseen, blah, blah, you know, so more discretionary language. But with some of the recommendations in this report about creating clearer 
site design standards that could be written more objectively. That isn't a state requirement to do it for commercial development, but it's more of a best practice that then everybody knows, right? The council and the commission have an opportunity to weigh in on specifically what the priorities are and shape that language. Um, the development community knows there's greater certainty about what kind of development you're gonna get. Um, and then because those standards are written more clearly, then there's an opportunity to use that staff level type two review um, that can also help expedite, save city time, as well as developer time, um, getting those developments, those commercial developments coming online. So um, that's a little clarification there. Um, and then about the underutilized commercial, I think uh, what I was perhaps inelegantly trying to, to summarize off of a very short bullet on a slide um, is that absolutely the city has discretion um, and has had, you know, important conversations about how to use commercial areas and, and what the role of housing could be in those areas moving forward. Um, and if the priority is on affordable housing um, rather than um, market rate housing in those areas, then there is no requirement, nor is there even a recommendation in this report to permit residential outright in these commercial zones. The specific recommendation is to provide some clarity around the rec around the current code language um, that talks about um, commercial storefronts, because if the goal is to have ground floor commercial, great. Um, that can still be the community priority, and that's entirely consistent with a mixed-use multimodal corridor that this project envisions. Um, but the code should, could just be more specific about what that means. Um, and how to measure that. Um, and there could be further conversation. Um, you know, I think sort of the, the bonus level, so to speak, is if there's further discussion about changing that, about there are some areas where we want this or some areas where it's more of a priority or some types of residential, say affordable housing, that are a greater priority than others, then looking at ways to structure that um, could also be worked in as part of these recommendations and in, well, as part of the implementation. And then the, the third piece about the CFA boundaries um, was a, a separate but um, overlapping process with ours. So I'll, maybe Kristen can, can fill you in on that. Sorry, it took me so long. Um, so the CFA was uh, developed with um, DLCD and uh, staff, and we went through different um, scenarios and different locations and felt that this location was right. This The council actually has acknowledged it. It hasn't been adopted. That wasn't something that the city wanted to actually do. So we have acknowledged that CFA area. We thought this made sense because it was along the Highway 99 corridor. Mostly we do have included in there, which may be a little cumbersome or difficult it is some of the historic district as well so that that might be a little bit difficult to deal with as far as the 50 feet um but um we felt that uh because of a lot of the area was a vacant property it's got um, the gateway project in there which isn't necessarily vacant at this time but has is earmarked for a different development and then the property across on west valley view in 99 we felt that was a large property and that would be adequate for the cfa area we needed to get up to i think 25 acres so that was why that area was chosen for between staff and the consultants forgive my ignorance but what does cfa stand for Climate friendly area, and it's it's at, the whole acronym is CFEC Climate Friendly Equitable Communities. Can I just ask you another question, there, Kristen? Is um, so adoption of the CFA is necessary prior to moving forward with any? Or what, you know, the what, council's already the city has already acknowledge our CFA area. So there's nothing that needs to be done with that. They also are working in tandem with this project, the uh, the uh, revisioning of 99 corridor. So that also is that they are also looking at our codes and how that how our codes need to be revised. And I think part of that is the parking criteria that 
um, is state mandated. Basically within, I think a quarter of a mile of all of our transit um, areas, there's no parking criteria at this time. And if we do require any parking, it will be EV parking. Uh, um, a certain percentage will be EV parking. Let me let me back up then. It and, and I'll, I hope this will be my last question. Commissioner, let me just get some clarification. Yeah, uh, when absolutely. you say they are working in tandem, you mean CFEC, is that right? Yeah, the CFEC. Okay, yeah. thank you. DLCD, yeah. So no what is the difference between acknowledgement and adoption? That's what I was trying to understand from your first. We just topic. didn't, we didn't, we, it's not going to, the, it's not being used as a, as a formal, um, report that we have to refer back to. We've acknowledged that this is our area and this is how we're moving forward. What will be adopted are the code changes that come before us. Uh, I see, thank you for, yeah, I was hard not tracking you, thank you. Commissioner Riley. So uh, I know this meeting isn't about CFEC, but uh, I I just wonder about the wisdom of moving forward until the lawsuits against the state about it have been settled. Do you want to answer that? I would just say it's noted for the record, but if you want to answer, by all means. Um, all the communities are moving forward with with um, the CFEC uh, criteria. Everybody's going forward until um, it's been, I think it's an appeal now and we'll find out. It may all go away, but I, I'm, uh, nobody's said anything so far so we're just going on as it's as we're required to we it's mandated for the um ors for the transportation planning so we're, it's a as of now it's a state mandate until it's otherwise we're otherwise told that's my understanding council clark yeah thank you um I uh, just wanted to speak to, uh, you know, the the greening of, of Highway 99 um, and really, uh, you know, highlight the extent to which, um, uh, you know, ecological health, economic health and um, social and community health are inter integrated and um, and the extent to which we can uh, facilitate that uh, will improve our uh, community and all of those uh, respects and uh, to that end, um, uh, last year the City of Talent received a um, grant from the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board to uh, plant around 1,100 trees uh, in the wake of the fire. Um, uh, and these are, you know, uh, street trees and and trees being planted in parks and around. Um, and one of the project areas is along Highway 99 and. Um, and that's been a uh, high priority area for uh, our urban forestry committee, uh, which is very active uh, since its uh, inception in uh, early 2020. Um, uh, so that 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 grant is funding, uh, you know, has uh, fund is funding trees um, maintenance, uh, three years of maintenance and and irrigation needs. Um, but to the extent that we could improve our greening potential, amplify the potential of that uh, through some uh, changes in infrastructure. Um, it has been discussed the possibility of um, exploring opportunities through the green infrastructure bill that was passed in the last uh, legislative session. And um, I don't believe that the, that the, the grant uh, process um, that will result from that is, um, is complete yet. Um, but some of the projects that have been discussed are um, number one, uh, modifying the existing medians so that they can accommodate uh, larger trees that will cast more uh, shade and uh, provide more effective uh, ecological functions. Um, and then secondary to that could be uh, looking at the potential if there's other medians that could be uh, created in, in gaps where um, the turn, turn lane isn't necessary um, in there. And then um, additionally, if, um, uh, sidewalks could be modified in a few locations to um, uh, to get some uh, trees closer to the to the street um, in certain locations and kind of change up the uh, uh, you know the strict linearity uh, of the sidewalk and and creates a few meanders in there. Um, so that's just a little bit of uh, update on um, you know um, both both work in progress and some other um, ideas that um, have been discussed. 
And I was also uh, just wanting to mention, uh, you know, really appreciate the uh, um, importance of uh, pedestrian and bicycle connectivity, uh, not both both from Highway 99 to the Greenway itself, but we also need um, some improvements between um, Talon Avenue and Highway 99. Um, one of those locations is uh, between Arno Street and Creel um, Street, and um, and one potential location that I have. Uh, uh, thought about and and could be explored would be um uh through the through the connection between cameron springs park and uh and totem pole uh, mobile home park um but um so yeah appreciate the presentation and um look forward to uh seeing where it goes from here thank you i just have a couple comments as well um i uh, so this is a study session no decisions are made um so I presume at some point in time, this is gonna come back uh, to us for um, further consideration to, to, uh, on the recommendations as part of the process. Um, and uh, I, you know, I think what I would like to see happen, and I mean this with all due respect, I, I realize this is gonna sound a lot like criticism, but um, before it comes back to us, I would hope that the staff takes an opportunity to look for uh, the redundancies in this report. Um, I, I was struck by um, the amount of redundancy there is in this report um, in in regards to things like <clears throat> the master plan uh, for gateway project. Um, uh, just, I mean, I you know I'd have to go through it again, and um, and I'd be happy to do that uh, to send in my uh, recommendations. I think Council or Commissioner Volkart um, pointed out. Uh, some of it when you were talking about um, Title 17 and Title 18. Um, so I'd like to see some of those redundancies be highlighted before we consider this, because I don't, you know, I think there are some uh, good pearls in here that we can work on, and I'd like to just drill down and focus on those. Um, the other thing um, that um, struck me is uh, the suggestion that we reduce or uh, we limit the number of storage units. I remember we asked if we could do that, and um, that came up once before, and, and our understanding was that we could not. Um, so I'd want to make sure that is, I mean, if we could do that, I'd want to work on that right now. And, um, and if we can do it, uh, for us to, um, yeah, for us to get to get work on it right away and not wait. Um, so uh, yeah, those are really just my two suggestions. Um, it's really gratifying uh, to see so much of our work validated in this way, especially with all the community uh, input, but also um, mentioning that we've also done a lot of community input, um, um, charrettes and, and town halls. Um, and honestly, I think we need to start looking at all of the different recommending reports that we've received, our own internal work, the work that uh, reimagine Oregon is done and uh, projects like this and start overlaying them and, and eliminating the redundancies because uh, there's a lot. And um, my recommendation too is that if there's an opportunity for this um, group to look at some of the work that's been done by some of the other organizations and the communities themselves, we've done a lot of, a lot of uh, community-led work. Um, yeah, to, to look for those um, places where we can kind of um, reduce some of the workload that's coming at us um, based on stuff that's already been adopted, really. Um, okay, so that's it for me. Um, I, but I do want to, yeah, I'll, uh, I do want to express my appreciation um, to uh, all of you for the great work that, that you bring before us. And Elizabeth, uh, Commissioner Volkart wasn't kidding. We've been asking for you to come back for <laughs> a couple of years, and we're, we're looking forward to having you back. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to go to uh, Councillor Panamariff, and then I'll, I'll come back to you, Commissioner Riley. Yeah, I did have a question. This was uh, in one of the documents. I don't know if it was uh, in the PowerPoint tonight, uh, but it, it was about um, an artist district uh, between uh, Phoenix and Talent. And I was just wondering, is that um, is that an idea about a special district uh, like defined in the Oregon statute? or something um, more informal? 
I do want to mention that Paul Sheldon was a part of the uh, CAC. I think it was Paul K. Uh, Paul K. Yeah, I'm sorry, not Paul. Yeah. Paul K. was a part of it, and and I wonder if that was um, so the same suggestion you brought before us. Yeah, hi. Um, I can just briefly respond to that. Um, it, it did come up during our placemaking workshops, and, and Paul was part of that conversation. It's obviously very passionate about the idea. Um, so we we wanted to make sure it was included um, and documented in our, our report. Um, and, you know, the idea, if you talked to Paul before, um, you know, he, he envisions it as a, as both a kind of community tool, but also an economic driver for the area. Um, and so we just highlighted it as a, something that came up and something worth considering and evaluating down the road, uh, but no strong recommendations uh, embedded in the reports at this point. Commissioner Riley? Uh, I, I almost forgot, but in one of the reports somewhere, it said that in 1997, the dam at Immigrant Lake failed, and that never happened. And I, I, we were here in 1997, there was a flood, but that dam never failed. And I checked with the manager at TID today just to make sure. And she assured me that in the last 100 years, there's never been a dam failure at Immigrant Lake. So that's a huge piece of misinformation that's in this report. Thank you. We'll I'll look for that and address that. One more suggestion uh, for staff too is it, it, I think it would be really great to discuss. There's a recommendation in here about uh, open uh, open public space, uh, open market. Um, we've talked about that many, many times uh, as it relates to the gateway project. And I would love to get that on the agenda for the next urban renewal um, meeting and just open that conversation up again as part of probably a, re a, a review of, um, you know, the planning, all of the planning that we've done on that site. Commissioners in the audience, do you have any questions? All right, seeing none. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, Laura? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, even though no decisions uh, are to be made at this meeting about the project, um, one of the goals is to confirm support for moving on to phase two. And so it would be helpful to have a motion just to um, say, yes, we as a city would like to move on to phase two because we're about to start scoping that out. Um, and so it would be helpful to have that recorded in the minutes um, so that we can have uh, clear direction that there is support for moving on to phase two. Um, so uh, we're in a study session and we can't uh, okay. make a motion in the meeting, but what we can do is put it on a future agenda. Um, it would be my hope that we'd put it on the agenda for the 17th with a staff report on what uh, the implications of adopting uh, or, or making such a motion would be for the city uh, to move on to phase two so that we can get a full staff report on that, maybe some input from the city attorney. Uh, can you wait till uh, January 17th for that? Yes, uh, yes, that would be fine. Thank uh, you. Objections to the city man with the city manager about putting that on the January 17th agenda? Yeah. So we'll uh, he, he'll go ahead and do that, uh, and uh, we'll get a staff report at that time. Okay, and just to be clear, it would not be a new contract. It would simply be an amendment to the existing contract. Uh, great, and just the very fact that I don't even understand that uh, <laughs> is a warrant for a, a good staff report. Okay. <laughs> Are there any more questions or comments? Right at 641, and we'll adjourn the study session. Thank you, everybody, for your uh, great, uh, great Thank input you. today. Thank you.